This lesson is about wave phenomena. First, let's talk about the motion of particles in a medium. It's important to remember that waves transfer energy without transferring mass. It could also be noted that the particles on a transverse wave move only up and down, and the particles on a longitudinal wave move only right and left. Let's take a look at an example. Here's a boat floating on top of water waves. The wave moves from left to right, and as the wave passes, the boat simply bobs up and down. I want to try to explain this a little bit further. So here we have two oscillations of a wave. The wave is traveling to the right. In the front of the wave, we have a trough, and at the end of the wave, we have a crest. This wave will always look just like that. It's just going to shift to the right as it moves. Let's take a look at a particular particle of this medium. We'll call it point A. Since this is a transverse wave, the particles of the medium are only going to oscillate up and down. Particle A is not a car on a roller coaster going up and down these hills. It's a particle of the medium, and it just vibrates up and down as this energy, the wave, travels to the right. We want to predict which way particle A will move in the next moment of time. A moment later, the wave will have shifted slightly to the right. Now remember, particle A can only move up and down, so it still has to be along this red dotted line. It should be obvious where particle A is now. It's at the top of this crest. Which way did it move to be on top of this crest? It moved up. If you need to predict the motion of a particle of a wave, ask yourself this question. Which part of the wave is coming next? If a crest is coming next, the particle has to move up to be on the crest. If a trough is coming next, then the particle has to move down to be in the trough. It really is as simple as that. Let's take a look at another example. Similar looking wave, traveling to the left, here's particle A. Once again, transverse wave, particle A can only move up and down. In the next moment of time, the wave has shifted slightly to the left. Let's ask ourselves that question. If we're particle A, what part of the wave is coming next? Particle A is already on a crest. The next part of the wave that's going to get there is a trough. Which way do you have to move to be in a trough? You have to move down to be in a trough. Okay, enough of that. Let's talk about the Doppler effect. There's going to be a lot of audio-visual examples here and not that much to write down, so just pay attention to all the video clips. That's the Doppler effect. But what is the Doppler effect, really? Uh, hey, what's Sheldon supposed to be? Oh, he's the Doppler effect. Yes. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. <laughs> oh, sure, I see it. Now the Doppler effect. As Sheldon said, the Doppler effect is the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. Let's take a look at a few more examples. During the next few clips, I'm going to try to explain why the Doppler effect happens. There's nothing to write down, so just pay attention. The red dot in the center represents the source of sound waves. The blue rings and the blue lines on the graph below represent compressions in the sound waves. And you can see that the source is emitting them at a pretty constant rate, and observer 1 is detecting them at the same rate. 
Observer 2, all the way over there on the right, is also observing them at the same rate. This is happening because there is no relative motion. The observers are not getting closer to or farther away from the source of the sound. There's no Doppler effect happening in that example. Now let's take a look at what happens when the observers of the sound wave move. The red dot in the center, once again, is the source, and you can see that it's emitting the same sound waves as before, but look at observer one over on the left. Since it's moving away from the source of the sounds, those blue rings get to it very infrequently, and you can see on the graph below that the frequency is much less than the source. Observer 2, on the other hand, is moving toward the source, which means it's encountering those blue rings much more frequently than they're actually being emitted, and we can see that on the graphs below. Let's take a look what happens when the source of the sound moves. That's like all those examples we saw with the moving train and the plane and the car. The red dot once again is the source, and it's emitting these waves at a constant frequency. But since it's moving to the right, the compressions on that side kind of get bunched up, and the compressions behind it kind of get stretched out. And so you can see that observer 1 intercepts those compressions less frequently than they are emitted, and observer 2 gets them much more frequently than they are emitted. It's important to note that the frequency of the source has not changed in any of these examples. But the apparent frequency, the observed frequency, from observer 1 or observer 2, changes based on the relative motion between the source of the waves and that observer. Now let's write down a couple of notes about this. If the source of the sound and the observer are getting closer, that is, they have relative motion toward each other, then the apparent frequency of the wave will be higher. And it doesn't matter which one's moving as long as they're getting closer together. If the source of the sound and the observer are getting farther apart, that is, they have relative motion away from each other, then the apparent frequency is going to be lower than the frequency that's actually being emitted. Finally, the greater the relative speed between the source and the observer, the greater the shift in frequency. I still don't get it. I'm the Doppler effect. Okay, if that is some sort of learning disability, I think it's very insensitive. Why don't you just tell people you're a zebra? Why don't you just tell people you're one of the seven dwarves? Because I'm Frodo. Yes, well, I'm the Doppler effect. Next, we'll talk about diffraction. Here's a cute stop-motion animation of diffraction. Diffraction is the bending of a wave around an obstacle, or the spreading out of a wave beyond an opening. Here are a couple diagrams. In both examples, we have those blue lines moving in from the right. We call those wave fronts. If these were water waves, you can imagine that each of those blue lines represents the crest of a water wave. When those waves reach the barrier, they can obviously only pass through in that small opening. But once they get through that opening, they spread out behind the barrier. There doesn't actually have to be a barrier with an opening. It can just be some obstacle, like you see on the right. And so when the wave fronts get there, they obviously can't pass through the barrier, but the parts of the wave that do get past the barrier will spread out behind it once they pass. Listen to what this guy has to say about diffraction. So what do you think controls how much the wave spreads out? Well, one possibility is the width of the aperture. And what do you think would happen if I made the aperture smaller? Well, you might be surprised to learn that a narrower aperture leads to more spreading out of the wave, more diffraction. If instead I make the aperture wider, Then after it's settled down, you can see that the wave becomes less spread out. The diffraction is less pronounced. So maximum diffraction occurs when the size of the opening is the same as the wavelength of the wave. Finally, we'll talk about natural frequency and resonance. 
The natural frequency of an object is the particular frequency that the object will vibrate if disturbed. When you pluck a guitar string, it vibrates at its natural frequency. Resonance is the vibration of a body at its natural frequency due to the action of a vibrating source of the same frequency. These two glasses are filled up to the same level, and when the glass on the right is disturbed and makes that obnoxious sound, the matchsticks on the glass on the left kind of wiggle around and then fall off. That's evidence of resonance. The vibration of the glass on the right causes the glass on the left to also vibrate.